Thank you for tuning in to the Unjiggered Podcast. If you enjoy listening, please consider subscribing and giving us a rating on your podcast service of choice. Also, don't forget to like and tag us on Instagram at unjiggered underscore media. Thank you to everybody for listening, and now on with the show. You're listening to Unjiggered, a bartender podcast where we interview highly successful bartenders about their careers, lives, and the passion of bartending. This week on the podcast, we have Simone Coparale. Listen as we chat about everything from his time at the Artisan, winning Bartender of the Year at Tales of the Cocktail in 2014, as well as his new project, Sips, in Barcelona. With this podcast, we want to peel back the mask and discover just how the greats really became the greats. So sit back and enjoy. Hi, I need to introduce myself according to what Michele said. My <laughs> name is Simone Caporale and I'm a bartender. Fantastic. Thank you for finding the time. How are you today? I'm good, Michele. Thank you. Grazie. Great. So you have a quite successful career. Uh, therefore, let's jump straight into it. First of all, would you like to tell us where you're from? Um, from north of Italy originally, from Lake Como. Is, there's, a, there's a bunch of tiny villages all around the shores of Lake Como. And I'm from one of those. Very tiny, very tiny. And uh, at what stage did you decide to get into bartending? Like, was that your plan all along or...? Well, I always enjoy since a child to uh, to serve people on the table, either with food or uh, I remember for my dad, I was always uh, uh, pouring a small shot of grappa every night from the cabinet. We used to have a small cabinet at home with some liqueurs. And I remember I like to open and close these little doors and, and tie the thing, you know, just to clean the things up in there, the glass, where. Uh, so I think I always enjoy this thing, but I took it. I realized that I could do something uh, when I was when I started working in a club as a, as a glass washer at 15 years old. I really liked the fact that I was working in a real bar, and uh, and I liked it. I loved it actually. What did you like about it? Uh, the um, uh, what impressed me straight away, and it's still I guess is one of the main things, is to see the expression of people uh, when so- they're having a good time at the bar, dancing. Yeah, just to read people's face, you know? So it's all about the actual, like, atmosphere. It's more about that than the actual drinks making. I, I would definitely say so, yes. Cool. Uh, so we all know you from yeah. uh, London, which is where, uh, like, I think London puts you on the, well, on the, on the global yeah, map. I, yeah, I mean, I, I live in London, and professionally, London gave me a lot, yes. I've been here for 11 years now. And uh, when did you decide to come over to London, and how did you go about that? It was 2009... Because previous that I was working in Como, in Como City, in Lake Como, in Italy. And uh, some of the colleagues said, if you like cocktails, you should go to London and have a look what's going on in there. And, and that's what, uh, what I've done. We, with my wife, Melissa, we just came over and we settled down at a, at a pretty young age because we were 22. I was 22. I mean, not so young, but also not so old, I would say. Uh-huh. And we moved here without knowing nobody. For us, it was just the fact that to get a job in a bar and, and see what happened, you know, without many big expectations, to be honest with you. At that age, at that age, you know, you have different expectations. You know? And how did you go about finding a job? Uh, so basically, I came over to London with a small book of a Galliano liqueur. Was was called? I still have it. It's called was called Galliano Guida, the Galliano Guide. It was a uh, it was a collection of different pictures of local bartenders back then. And the entire project was created by Agostino Perone, which at that time was the brand ambassador of Galliano. Uh-huh. So I said, with this book, I can literally recognize people by the face because there's pictures of them, there's a name, there's the bar where they work. And I will definitely go and visit all this bar, having a drink, and I would ask if I can get a job. And that's what I did. And uh, one of the people in the book... Um, which was uh, Esther Medina, uh-huh. uh, she gave me the job. Uh, she was the bar manager of a Roast, was a bar restaurant in, in a borough market. And that was my first job in London. And what was your position? I was bartender. Oh, that's cool. So you. But I remember, I, re- I, remember uh, I was a junior bartender. Mm-hmm. I wasn't aware of the fact there were different, um, let's say, a hierarchy, you know, or, Generally, we have a barbeck, bartender, and head bartender. And I remember that I was not allowed to wear uh, armbands because 
only when you were a bartender you could wear a hairband. No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. How did you progress after that? Like, what is it that you did? To... Oh, he excite, he excite me. Yes, he, he excites me and uh, work with Esther. And then I met Alex. I met Alex, which who was already working in Langham. And one year later, he asked me if I wanted to join to Langham. Okay. To the artisan. What year was that? Uh, it was 2010. Okay. And uh, how was the artisan yeah. at that stage? And what uh, did, did you guys already have a vision of what you wanted the bar to be? Or how did you go about that? Well, before I joined, uh, the second bartender was uh, Marian, Marian Becker. Okay. So it was Alex and Marian. Then Marian left and Alex asked me if I wanted to join the, the bar. Mm -hmm. And the bar, when, I, when I came there, first of all, was my very first experience inside of a five-star hotel bar and a hotel also. So the, the atmosphere for me was already magic, Okay. Uh, personally speaking. And then with the time, we, we, we start to contribute uh, together to what Artisan eventually became after. So it was more of a, like a learning process. So it's not that you worked towards a specific goal. You kind of like try to figure out the identity of the no, bar as you were was, going. Yeah, it was absolutely a learning process because uh, we were lucky the fact that nobody ever told us what to do. But at the same time, nobody ever told us what not to do, you know. So it's been a, a, a continuous learning process, big time, and we fall with our face plenty of time, uh, but it was worth, was worth. So one of the things that I think was, I mean, at least from the outside that we, uh, I noticed as, as an amazing part of the success of the Artesian was the, the team. Yes. How did you guys manage to put the team together and what did you guys do to keep the team together? Well, we was, it was, um, Alex was the first person literally to uh, motivate everybody uh, because also was the uh, more adult, the more grown up and the more experienced. Mm -hmm. Of course, year by year, every one of us was having one extra years of experience as well on top of that. So uh, the more you grow and the more you will be able to motivate either yourself and the, and, and the new colleagues coming. And this was, uh, and also to be honest with you, we were... Uh, we were eating, we were breathing, we were sleeping, we were uh, we were dreaming about that place, you know. So we dedicate the I would say ninety percent of our time we were dedicated to the bar, working time and free time. B basically, on your day off, you were you were at the bar doing things, you know. You uh, even you were doing shift even on your day off to learn and to do things, to set up, to prepare the new menus. And uh, funny enough, the the hotel was so messed up that nobody ever realized you were there in your in your day off, for example. You know, uh, now th this this can sound very messy, but for us it was an advantage because we always have complete freedom. At the same time, as I said before, nobody ever told us what not to do. So uh, our mentor eventually was where our mistakes, you know, and uh, and also for example, let's say you were scheduled to start at five o'clock, perhaps in the afternoon, but most of us, we were going there 3 o'clock, 3.30 every day. It was our spontaneous choice because we knew that in order to do something specific, you have to do a little bit more. And this is, this is something that uh, when people ask me, explain it, and most people, they don't get it. But if you, if you really want to do what you want to do, you need to also manage your time. And you need to forget about that uh, all the things uh, can be done in an eight-hour shift. Which is sad because it would be great to have your spare time to sleep your hours and so on. But in that case, it was not the the best scenario. So you need to, you have to work your ass, you know. I see. And we had colleagues that that came with the with the dream to be there with us. You know, the famous bar, the award, is that. But after after two weeks' work, they were they were crying, you know. Yeah, because it's hard work. You know, we was taking a lot from you. And you know, a lot from your spare time, a lot from your private life as well. Uh, also a lot from your health, because if you sleep four hours a day, and on top of that you drink, because you're young, so your body can f hold it, let's say, you are, you, are, you are also damaging yourself. But back then, we, just, we, 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 we were going to one direction. And the direction was not, the, the direction was not uh, win another award, eh? not at all was the fact to be free to express yourself through the cocktail experience. 
But uh, so the awards eventually came, but they were never the actual goal. No, no. And every year we were getting more surprised the fact that we were getting those because uh, any anytime we were getting an award, for example, now we were going back to the bar and we, we were saying to the colleagues, listen, yeah, today might be a special day because of this, but tomorrow is going to be a new day. So forget about what, has, what happened today, you know, because eventually most of colleagues start to uh, sit on a pillow of uh, glory and that doesn't move you any further, you know, especially if you don't know what to do with the glory, you know. How did you guys drive the creative process? Because that was such a big part of what the artisan was, right? Uh, yes, it was, uh, it was a generous part of what we were doing. So every weekend, Saturday night, which is in theory, I mean, you know, in theory, practically is the most tiring shift because you go already the rest of the week over your shoulders. Uh, after the shift, around 3 a.m., we were sitting down and uh, we were doing uh, creative sessions. Each of us was bringing a topic or an idea or a solution in the middle of the table. And then we, and we were discussing it together, taking notes and documenting it. And then that is an exercise that might be a little bit tough or hard or pointless, especially when it's Saturday night when you're super tired. But in those 25, 30 minutes of session every, every weekend, uh, we were gathering uh, material, which was enough to make uh, a new cocktail menu, a, a various number of cons external consultancy, brand development. Uh, we could have done books as well, which we never been interested in back then. So those 30 minutes were, were the, was the biggest investment of time ever, even though the bar was closed. The bar wasn't making any money because mm -hmm. it was closed. Uh, however, those 30 minutes generate uh, for the bar and for ourselves over those years, a few several million pounds for, for the bar and for ourselves, not just for ourselves. Don't get me wrong. I wish. <laughs> yeah, <but>. right. <laughs> So, and, and therefore, like you guys had, uh, in terms of the menu development, which is what I, fi I find quite interesting and amusing, mm. how did you guys uh, come up with like menu concepts and stuff like that? Was it still from the creative sessions or was it something that came from like maybe you, Alex, or? It was from the creative session. To be honest with you, um, and still nowadays when I, I often see Alex for a, for a coffee or I go to see them in their bar in Tayer Elementary with Monica, and uh, sometimes you, you always you, you start to talk about something, then eventually you end up talking about when you, you were working together. And we don't recall every, any single um, moment when you, you can say, oh, that was your idea or my idea or his idea, because we were thinking together so much that suddenly you didn't, you didn't realize, you didn't care anymore who was the first idea to be put on the table. So back to your question, the menu, those menu definitely came after this uh, creative session, yes. Uh, which when we were, of course, not just the topic of the menu, but the menu itself, the solid part, have to be part of the topic. So the material, the shape, how to read the cocktail, how to describe the cocktails as well, was part of our uh, challenge, I would say. So... Uh... Eventually, the Artesian experience came to an end. Uh, would you like to talk to us about what was the thought process behind it when you guys left, if you feel comfortable? Yeah, yeah. we decided yeah, yeah, yeah. We decide to leave in, in the... I remember on the 8th of October 2015, we gave the notice. And it was me, Alex. But, but, uh, well, a few hours before, I, I said to the rest of my colleagues, the guy today... Uh, most likely, I will be in some condition to give the notice. And uh, just so you know, you know, I said, Simon, if you give the notice, we want to give the notice. Hey, guys, don't be silly. Because back then, I was already doing uh, several projects outside the bar. So uh, I was kind of a cover, fin financially speaking. Mm -hmm. But I knew that the rest of my colleagues, uh, they were just working in, in the bar. And uh, I said, don't be silly. Don't, don't give the notice just because I'm giving the notice. Because... Tomorrow you will be jobless, and tomorrow I will I will have plenty of things to do from my side. So uh, and and I insist on that. Anyway, by the time I reached the hotel, there were uh, was myself and Alex for the notice, and nine more printed notice for the other nine colleagues. And uh, so I say, if you guys leave, we leave. And we gave the notice. We gave the notice, and uh, of course the hotel tried to 
change our minds. So why don't we speak tomorrow? So no, no, there's the notice and that's it. Uh, we went back to the bar and um, that night was also the night of the 50 best uh, bar ceremony. Uh, and we knew we were uh, we we knew we were on the 50 uh, because on the 50 best because you you always receive an email that you are invited because you've been selected and you know congratulations blah blah blah. But of course we didn't know about that, that night uh, we for the fourth consecutive year the bar was awarded as the first of the 50 best bar. And uh, and I remember then after. I mean, it was seven, eight o'clock from the bar. Me and I, we went to the ceremony. And when we left the bar, we just had with a shot of mezcal and with the rest of the colleagues, just, just uh-huh. to wish everybody luck. And, and also for the fact that we knew that that was our first day of the last 30 days working mm-hmm. there. And I remember I said, guys, uh, today we're going to make history, you know, because, uh, because of the fact of the, of the notice. And it was a massive notice, 11 people out of 20. But also it came out that we also made history because that day we just, we fucked everybody in terms of the system, but also we, we brought back to the bar this, uh, the fourth uh, year award. So it was a, was a, was a emotional day for us. Are you still in contact with the team members from Artesia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of them actually, you know what makes me super happy? that any one of them um, went somewhere else and any one of them has been very successful. Think about Andrea Gualdi opened his own bar in Sydney. Uh, Balaj Molnar opened his own bar last week in Budapest. Uh, Rudy became the, is a global brand ambassador of, uh, of, um, of uh, Amaro Montenegro. Uh, Eva, she's taking care of a training program of a Zuma, Zuma group in US. So uh, Jamie is... Uh, He's taking care of a. He did a spectacular project in the bamboo bar in the in Bangkok in Thailand. So everyone of us managed to do something great even after. That's fantastic to hear, huh? And I, I think there was a good uh, training uh, camp. Yeah. That bar for all of us. So just to close the chapter on the Artesian, if you could describe the ethos behind the bar of like what. what the ethos of the style of service there? How would you describe it? Well, we wanted to make everybody happy and feel everyone special when they were entering the bar. No matter if it was a, a celebrity, if it was a, somebody working in the BBC studio next door, even if it was a tourist or if it was a, a bartender who decided to spend their day off to come and see us from London, even for, from abroad. We were receiving a lot of uh, visitors of the bar industry all around the world in the bar, and, and we want we wanted to to praise the fact that they decide to commit their time, their money as well, to come and see us. So, so we need to make everybody happy in this place. That's that's the main purpose of a bar. No, it might look special, but that's the essence of a bar. You go there to feel happy. Very well said. Awesome. So now we talked about the Artesian. Uh, now it's 2015. You're unemployed. What happened next? What was the plan after that? Well, uh, back then, personally, I was already doing uh, various projects nationally for Peroni Nostro Azzurro. Uh, I had some uh, um, contract globally with uh, Di Saronno, the, uh, Di Saronno uh, with Martini as well, Martini Vermouth, back then. Uh, what else? And then the, the, the project of Italicus was getting ready as well was still under incubation, but it was getting, uh, getting shape, you know, which would eventually happen uh, two years after. But. And uh, I have some uh, consultancy project in Asia back then, in South America. So basically from the 2015 until the 2018, Michele, everything went so fast. Yeah? Like in a blink of an eye. Yeah, too fast, I would say. Do you miss working behind the bar? Uh, I miss working behind the bar, but physically I won't be able to work every day behind, behind the bar like before because my back is destroyed in an unreversible uh, uh, state, so I cannot get better. I can, only, I can only maintain as it is, but I cannot be better, unfortunately. So physically I won't be able to work every night behind the bar. I have to accept it, you know. But you still kind of miss it, do you? Of course. I think it's the things that I most miss. Just a simple gesture of uh, 
uh, giving a cocktail napkin to a guest, you know, is uh, something so simple, but I miss that gestures, you know. Uh, talking about some of the highlights of your career, uh, probably like cocktail competitions fall under that. You've done quite a few. I've done a few. I don't think that I've done many. I mean, compared to some of my colleagues, I haven't done many. Uh, why? Well, uh, we when we were in London, we were definitely aiming that one of us would have gone to a, a cocktail competition. Either Alex, myself, or Rudy, or Roman, or Andrea. One of us have to represent the bar. But then from the... Yeah, from 2014, I said, let, let, let's let the, the, the other colleagues go, no? Just to, we, we are doing the drinks together, training together, and that's just you go to get confident with it as well, no? And, uh, but I haven't done many. I mean, I've, I've done some, but, and I also don't, don't think that I won many of those. Eh? I remember the, the World Class, 2014 World Class, I won the London Heat, and I was meant to uh, compete with the rest of the UK. Winners of the of the day, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. And we were meant to be on a plane from London to New York, do something on the plane, land in New York, come back to London. So the competition was on air on the plane. But very uh, honestly, I said I've been paroled in 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 the US a few years before, so I was there without visa, and I cannot go to US without a visa. So the agent said, "Look, we are not going to let you board on the plane for this." So they, not that they disqualify me, but they say, next year you can start from where you were this year in the world class. And I was very sad about it. Uh, because finally I could eventually represent UK or, you know. But that summer, that summer on the uh, Tales of the Cocktails uh, Are You Conspirited Award, I, was, I received the award of an uh, international bartender of the year. So, so I guess that makes it, does it? <laughs> Well, no, but the thing is, for me, I was still, uh, uh, I was still sad the fact that I was rejected by somebody, you know, which was the this competition. But you know, I, I, everything happened for a reason, I think. So I have to accept it as it was. In fact, I di- I couldn't go to US neither to to the award ceremony because I didn't have a visa. Did you fix that? Did you go to the US? I- after after that, yes. Okay. Because my father was still was still living there, so I have to sort out my visa in order to go and see him. Now I, I have a business visa, so I can go in there as much as I want. That's crazy, though. Huh? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. You get one of the highest awards. You get like the Oscar in bartending, and you can't go and pick it up because of a visa. I, yeah, I couldn't <laughs> go and pick it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, about uh, going back to it, like, do you see value into competitions? Why, why did you think that everyone should enter any competition? Absolutely, uh, is I think it's one of the best business cards you can uh, you can have for yourself to do um, competition, because first of all people get to know you, and you also you get to know many colleagues that eventually you you, you wouldn't be able to meet so many in a day, and then for example Alex Alex met me in one of the competition he was judging with Eric Lawrence I remember it was a UKVG competition he was judging with Eric Lawrence and some other uh, experienced bartender. And uh, and I was competing, you know. And I, I got some of those pictures in, in somewhere in Facebook. And there was a 36th competitor, and my score was a 35th. So I was basically, I, I, did, I wasn't doing very well at all, you know, in that competition. But I remember that um, at the end, Alex and Eric came over, to, because I have a vintage strainer, which was like a silver-plated vintage strainer that I found in, in Portobello Antique Market. And um, and we started talking about this. Basically, basically that's how we, we, we get to know each other. And and I believe that that very bad competition gave me the chance to work with Alex. That's such a cool you know? story. <laughs> so, if, and also one thing that Alex always told us and to other colleagues as well, there's no competition that you have lost. There's only competition you haven't done. So that means that do all of them, no matter how you qualify yourself, do all of them because you can always learn. That's super cool. So tell us, uh, what do you do now? Now, today... In, in this day and age, yeah. Well, today, Thursday, now I'm on the, uh, I'm on the office uh, speaking with you. But uh, about what I'm doing now more, uh, more widely, we... With Alex and Monica, we are still continuing a consultancy in South Korea. 
which keeps me busy every month because I go there one week every month. Then uh, together with Alex and Monica as well, we've launched over one year ago the project of uh, Muyu Liqueurs, which is uh, expanding slowly, but it's expanding. Uh, it's available in UK, in Holland, in Italy, in Austria, mm-hmm. in Germany, Israel, Croatia. So Muyu Liqueur. Then together with the family of Diplomatico in Venezuela, we have launched another project, which is called Canaima Gin. It is a gin. Uh, even though we didn't want to make a gin, but we have to categorize it under the umbrella of gin, is a distillate of the Amazon forest. The fruits are collected by uh, local uh, indigenous groups, and the POS are made by uh, different groups of different ethnic group of uh, other indigenous group of the Orinoco River in the Amazon uh, region of Venezuela. And uh, and the ten percent of the sales, not the profit, Michele, eh? or the or sales, the sales crazy. are crazy. Uh, yes are reinvested into um, reforesting the Amazon through a beautiful project in Colombia called Saving the Amazon, which I went there myself uh, this Christmas, last Christmas, to see what was going on. And they're doing a spectacular thing with, uh, with indigenous groups. And we already, uh, look, by December, we had already planted or commissioned the planting of uh, 470 trees. But by the end of this year, so by the end mm-hmm. of 2020, we will reach approximately 2,000 trees. Fantastic. From the sales of a Canaima Jean. That's awesome. This is one of the projects. Uh, on top of that, there is uh, the Flavor Blaster, which has uh, started a year ago. It's this device that produces an aromatic uh, uh, vapor in order to replace what the, uh, what the generic smoking gun has been for many of us. I'm also helping the the team of El Bulli um, restaurant based in Barcelona to write the third Oridian, the fourth um, edition or volume of the Cocktail Sapiens, which is a sort of a university of the cocktail inside of uh, different books. Keep in mind that there's no uh, cocktail recipe in there, but there's there's an analytic study um, of uh, even very holistic of what the cocktail is, what the bar business is, what the alcohol is, what the ice is, and so on. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a university instead of a, a book, to be honest with you. That's awesome. And and I and then I think it's I think it's it. That's it. <laughs> that's that's more than uh, enough. Oh, no, though. sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, I forgot. I forgot. Uh, in fact, in thirty minutes, I have a phone call with the rest of the team. Uh, we are opening a bar in Barcelona. The Sips. Sips bar, where part of the bar will serve a uh, liquid under the measure of a sip. So you can have uh, anything you like in a, in, a, in a smaller amount. That's such a cool thing. We will go from the cocktail, from a cocktail selection, from an expensive, uh, let's say, whiskey, and so on. Yeah. I actually forgot, my goodness. That's where all, that's where all my savings went, and I completely <laughs> forgot to tell you, Jesus. So let's touch about uh, some of those uh, highlights. So first of all, I'd like to ask you about the Muyu liqueurs. So what, what yes. was the thought process behind it, and how did you guys go about making them? Okay. In 2015, together with Monica and Alex, we went to visit the Amazon region of Peru. We like it a lot. We see um, so many new things. Uh, everything was new for us back then in the Amazon. And we decided that could be a good uh, inspiration point to express it into a flavor. But at the same time, that we could use our skills of create a product in order to uh, bring something back to that part of the world. And in fact, uh, Muyu, uh, and every year, ourselves, we match, ourselves, we put an amount of money, and the rest of the project that is made from the Kuiper distiller in Holland, they match their amount of money and goes to a, a humanitarian or a, what you would call charity project for the Amazon. And uh, there are three different liqueurs. Each of them has been created by either by Monica, by Alex or Simone, uh, which pretty much represent our character, our style, our flavors. And technically speaking, the making of this liqueur has been, uh, is made following the structure of a perfume, which means that you go a, a, a core notes, a center notes, a center flavor, and then you go smaller uh, sources of flavor that complement the main notes. So Monica created the, 
a jasmine verde, the, the green jasmine, which have also a neroli inside, petit grain, sherry wine. Alex created the vetiver gris, which is the vetiver roots with the timur pepper and cedarwood. And I created the quinotto nero, which is this quinotto citrus, together with the uh, yuzu, uh, oak moss, cinchona. So you got a citrus one, you got a floral one, and you got a hearty one. Three different liqueur. But the, created from bartender for the bartenders. But the liqueurs are such a, a not fashionable uh, category. Why did you guys decide to create a liqueur rather than something else? Well, you are right, there are not fashionable uh, liqueurs because uh, most of people never ask themselves whether what kind of function they could up bring into a, a drink. And most of the liqueurs you find in the market, they have a flavor, whatever, and they have a, a, a very generous source of sweetness. So anytime you put it into a drink, they bring the flavor and they bring up quite excessively the sweetness. Muy liqueur, you have a core flavor, as I explained, uh, some other uh, small flavors around it, you got, of course, a little bit of alcohol, then you got acidity and sugar. Uh, saying acidity means that these are uh, liqueurs that have a, a, already a natural source of acidity mm -hmm. inside of that, which allow to uh, auto-balance the form of the cocktail. So wherever you put those kind of liqueurs, they will match with the rest of the ingredient. The acidity they can match to a citrus, the acidity that can match to a tannin uh, notes of a, of a vermouth, of a sherry, of a, of a dark spirit, and so on. So it was, technically it is a liqueur, but as I said, the making of it definitely doesn't come from liqueur making. And there is a technical function of the recipe because of this uh, uh, flavor, acidity, and sugar. Generally speaking, most of the liqueur contain between 28 to 30 up percent of sugars. A muyu contain between 21 and 24 percent sugar because there are three different so. so so remarkably less sugar but not for a matter of a diet to be honest with you for a matter of flavor and for a matter of function that's super cool and uh so and they will be available thank you they're, they're doing well and they will be available worldwide soon hopefully every year we tend to add uh, some extra countries of course, it's not easy because you can be as good as you want making drinks or running a bar, but running a brand is completely different thing. A, a liqueur brand is completely different matter. But every day, anyway, um, little by little, things are, are, are getting, getting, getting better. But a, anyway, we didn't make any return of investment yet, for example. So it's uh, still a very early stage. Yeah, you launched, what, two years ago? Uh, well, less. Less, yeah. One year and... Uh, one year and four months ago. Cool. So let's touch upon the bar uh, in Korea. Uh, would you like to talk about that and uh, what you th uh, some of your thoughts about the Korean market? Yeah. Uh, well, we used to have some guests coming to see us in the Artesia many years ago. They were Korean. They were coming, taking pictures, having drink and so on. And we didn't know that one of them was a family member of the Samsung family, the same that produced phones and so on. And uh, they have opened uh, an independent uh, brand of hotel in Korea. They start to open it. And uh, the first was open two years and a half ago. And, uh, and they said, who shall we call for the, for the bar? And I said, oh, we should call those guys that we used to go and having a drink to in London. And they called us. So we suddenly find ourselves to work with one of the most powerful uh, financial, I would say, uh, family in uh, of Asia. And for sure in Korea, mm -hmm. and this this uh, it fascinates me because you never know who do you have in front when you are serving some guest. You know, you can give him a glass of water, a cup of coffee, or whatever it is, or a cocktail, and these people eventually will call you years later for something uh, exciting. You know, uh, this was is a beautiful uh, for me. It's a beautiful example that I remind myself very often that. You look after everybody well because you never know who you got in front. And of course, you look after everybody well because in, in theory, um, this work comes from your heart, you know? the heart of serving, the heart of making people feel well Absolutely. in the bar. 
So the bar is called Marc d'Amour, and the entire hotel and the bar also has been designed by Jacques Garcia, the famous architect who created Hotel Coast um, in Paris, um, Nomad Hotel in New York, and, I mean, all the Nomad Group. And uh, yeah, and the bar has been open uh, over two years. Korean market, it's quite saturated with bar. The small cocktail bar now that are consumer. But the cocktail itself is something new. It's young, it's less than 20 years in terms of awareness in Korea. And uh, the location is, is not a very busy location. So people that come there are people that decide to come and see you there, which is good. But it's not a very strategic, it's not a strategic location. Mm -hmm. So it's not very centric, let's say, of the city. But everybody loves it so far. And... Um, the team is doing uh, super well. The head bartender is uh, Max Rockman, which I work uh, I worked with him in 2011 in Moscow, and now he's taking care of the project there. And I was meant to go this month as well, but because of the virus, uh, they're not allowed to. You're not allowed to go there unless you spend some quarantine and so on. So I might go in July again. Fantastic. And how's the menu there? What's the What's the idea there of the bar? Like, what's the concept? Well. Uh, over there, in that part of Asia, because of the fact that the cocktail culture is so young, just a few they can choose uh, based on their experience of the cocktail, of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Let's say you know you know a daiquiri, you know this, you know that. So we had to create a menu where allows you to choose something that you like or something that stimulates uh, interest in within a few seconds. So we go drawings. The name of the drinks, the drawing, so the way it look like, and uh, just three key elements uh, in Korean and in English. So just with a literally in 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 a second by looking at the this ingredient, you really know if you like it or not. Okay. And that and that uh, brought an extreme uh, positive uh, repercussion in terms of consumption, in terms of sales, and so on. So. We went there thinking that it was like London, and we realized that no, it was not like London. So we had to readapt all the ideas in the course of the first year in order to make sure that everybody could literally understand and enjoy. Because ultimately, uh, you might not understand all the things, but you need to enjoy them, you know? Agreed, absolutely. Yeah. But if you understand something, most likely it will stimulate the fact that you will like it even more because you don't feel stranded, you don't lose the orientation. And if you disorient a consumer, they might do the wrong choice or they might not enjoy completely the experience. Absolutely, totally agree. Uh, so this leads us to the book, uh, your El Bulli book, which I think is a quite interesting uh, thing to talk about. Yes. So tell us, why did you decide to work with El Bulli? What was the, th uh, the thought process behind it? How did this start? And what's the aim of the book? Well, uh, first of all, uh, what I'm doing is um, it's something that I consider important because as soon as we start doing it, I said, I wish this trick could have existed 15 years ago so I could benefit myself in terms of knowledge uh, without the experience. And now, uh, instead, we decide to dedicate some... Everybody does it for free. Eh? It's, like a, it's literally like a sort of like a volunteering thing. A very well-organized volunteering. Um, the entire project is led by, of course, Ferran Adria, and um, the content, uh, so the, who administrate this uh, content, who receive the information, who, who organize them, is Luis Garcia, which has been the, the maitre d' and the, let's say, the manager or the maitre d' of El Bulli restaurant, mm -hmm. which have a beautiful, uh, incredible skills of writing and explaining and teaching and uh, the contributors in, inside of it is, uh, well, first of all, there's uh, 80 people of the El Bulli team uh, in Barcelona doing all this research. And then externally, there is uh, Javier de las Muelas, the founder of uh, Dry Martini, Barcelona. Uh, there's uh, Marc Alvarez, which is also one of the business partners of uh, Sips Bar, the bar we are about to open. There's me. There is, uh, there is, there is uh, Manel Veia, who is a... Uh, a very talented bartender in Cadaqués. His father used to also know Salvador Dalí. They have a beautiful bar in Cadaqués. Oh, that's in so the cool. Tower. Yeah. 
and uh, and yeah so there are uh, we start to do the first volume about uh, a little bit of uh, what the cocktail is the second was about uh, managing and running the business uh, operating a bar and then we wanted to do the third one which was about ingredient and tools and techniques but then we realized that one book was not enough so we're doing one book now of uh, ingredient another one of techniques and another one of um, tools so from from three books became six books and the first and the second are already available the third and fourth and the fifth and the sixth will be ready in the next year they are in spanish now but it, they will be translated in bulk all of them in english from the next year but uh, so the books are more about the individual aspects of uh, bartending rather than having a book that is like your classic book format where you talk about recipes and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 exactly. There's no one single recipe of cocktail in this because we don't see the point to, to, to make a book of recipe where you can find millions of books already with millions of recipes already available, even for free on on internet, you know, what's the point? Uh, but for example, we got... The, the third one, which is about to be launched, it will have uh, 37 pages about ice. The study about ice, the physics, the chemistry, and all these things. And before this book, the, the only uh, source of interesting things about ice for Barr was the uh, Dave Arnold book, you know? Indeed. Yeah, that's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but, for example, this is, uh, like as I said, this is you can do your university of cocktail. You can open a cocktail school with bar school with these books. Of course, you need to study them before. So it's something that makes me really happy because uh, I, I've been personally very lucky so far in, in my work, and I think it's fair to dedicate some time to share these things back or to, or to wants to learn. And also, be a bartender in Europe is quite privileged because you get most of the resources. But be a bartender in other part of the world is not so. Uh, you don't have so many advantages, and I think it's fair that we can do this and uh, and share it with uh, whoever is interested to know. Absolutely right. More about that's absolutely right. Great. So we're about to wrap this up. So just a few words about your bar. You talked about the fact that uh, you want to like it's going to be called sips. Everything is going to be available in very small portions. What is the what, what is this bar gonna feel like? What, what the, what's the kind of vibe you guys are going for? Well, uh, the place is, is uh, will be divided in two different areas, not because we want it, because you have no choice. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, so let's say let's say you have a front bar and a back bar, sort of. The back bar approximately will have between twelve to fifteen seats, so very small, and will be very experimental. So you can expect there to see something very bizarre. And the front bar is more uh, casual, playful, of course, uh, funky, uh, where you can have a, a good glass of wine, an interesting beer, uh, and some cocktails that you perhaps you are familiar to. can be some classic, uh, um, slightly twisted, or some classic untouched, uh, good bars, snacks, and so on. So a place where you don't think about it, and then you go in a place where it will make you think, you know? In terms of experience, which it can be also, it's kind of the, exactly the opposite, no? And uh, we will, of course, the the front place will be the one that have to generate the the money for paying the rent, paying mm -hmm. the salary, and the the place in the back is the one that eventually will generate uh, uh, more uh, innovation and creativity things. But of course, we aim to adapt this in both spaces, and it's called uh, Sips. You can also see on Instagram uh, Sips uh, Barcelona, and uh, we are ready. We will be ready in August with the construction work to be finished, and then we are checking if there are the condition to open the bar straight away because of the virus, or either uh, wait a couple of more weeks or months. Let's see. Fantastic. Why did you choose Barcelona, if I may ask? Barcelona is a, to me is a very young city, rich of colors. Of rich of culture, um, super artistic. Uh, think about the artistic movement in there, the color, shape, and art and sculpture. Uh, it's on the it's on the sea, it's on the beach, and I love the beach. Uh, it's still uh, I mean, it's not cheap, but it's definitely much more affordable in terms of investment if you compare it to London. Yeah. And, and funny enough, then you can end up selling the cocktails at the same price as you would sell in London. You know. 
uh, but the rent can be five or even more time cheaper than London. Absolutely crazy. So the the risk is a is a is the, is a, there's a different financial risk that you do. But if things go well, eventually the profit can be pretty much similar. That's fantastic. So and that's why I I waited I waited I waited because if you want to open your bar. Uh, for the sake of open it and as soon as possible because people are ex- expecting something from you hey, eventually you might regret so i rather take my time and when you find a good condition you go for it you know also all the all, all the money that i managed to save in this year with the other work i put them into it so i, I had to be careful in order to where to do it how to do it uh, financially speaking and so on because if something goes wrong Everything goes wrong, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of times you have, you have examples of bars that have opened with the rush of opening a bar and then they might end up in the wrong street or in the wrong neighborhood and they just jeopardize the very existence of it, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, as we used to have a few years back in the, in, the, in the Artisan, we had a lot of freedom. And once you get used to have that, it's very difficult to live without it. Mm. So I wanted to be free from the fact that there was no uh, financial pressure that would hold me, hold me by the neck. So I rather <laughs> well enjoy en- yeah, enjoy and, and play professionally in a bar r- rather than be under a unnecessary pressure, you know. Agreed. Of course, you're running a business. You're running a business. You're not playing. You're not playing uh, selling peanuts, you know. But uh, this is the main reason why the financial pressure is different there. Great. I was going to ask you what kind of advice you'd give to a younger bartender, but I think you're writing six books about it, so that should be fine, right? Yes, but I will, I will definitely say don't do things too fast. Everybody likes to rush and to run. Everybody wants to get there in two, three years, and it doesn't work like that. I'm sorry. Uh, Rome was not built in a day. Uh, a seven years old a Cuban rum is called so because it's been there seven years old, not three weeks, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so, and if, if you want to grow too fast eh, for no reason, your bones will not be able to sustain your body professionally and mentally and experience. You, know, you, you, can, you can have the best palate ever. You can, you can come out with the, the most incredible cocktail ever, but if you're not able to, to manage it, three guests at a time, you know, able to, to speak to a colleague, uh, you, you, you won't take you anywhere. I think you're in the wrong business if you think that things get fast, you know. Uh, things take the time it takes. And, uh, and in bartender, the beauty of that is the ex- fact that you do it with the experience, and the experience takes time. I love the analogy there, like the fact that, uh, you know, you need strong bones before you can actually sustain, you know, yourself professionally. Yeah, have you seen those chicken? Have you seen those, uh, uh, the, you know, the... The, the, the chicken industry, you know, they grow so fast that they, the, the muscle they cannot hold the body and they collapse, mm-hmm. no, after a few weeks. And that's exactly what happened to this bartender who, who think that the bartending is what they see on the video, and that's not true. And maybe the, the, the blame goes to the one that, the previous one that they created this system, this model, no? But anyway, it's what it is. Is what it is. It's a, it's a natural selection, Michele. I know, right? <laughs> cool. Uh, the very last question I'd like to ask you today yeah. is if you could choose uh, your very last drink, what would that drink be? A glass of water, I would say. Why? A glass of water, ah, because when you're thirsty, for me, the pleasure you feel having a, a, a cold glass of water, it's uh, uncomparable. Uh, if not, uh, I would say a nice daiquiri. I like the glass of water, yeah. though. I think I think that's the that's the that's the way forward. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Simoncino. Uh, let's say water first and a daiquiri. After. <laughs> the last drink is two drinks. Cool. <laughs> Simoncino was awesome to talk to you. Thank you so much. It was so valuable. My pleasure. Prego. Ciao, Michele. Best of luck with your bar. Huh? And you come to see me at Sips in Barcelona. Ciao. I'll do my best. Ciao. 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 Grazie.